This is the tragic story of Jacques Waller, a beloved mother of triplets who found herself in a tumultuous marriage. After enduring her husband's depraved behavior, she finally mustered the courage to request a divorce. However, as is often the case in such narratives, this tale too ends in tragedy. Before we dive in, our hearts go out to all the families impacted by the terrible actions of this individual. Now let's explore Ste Genevieve, Missouri. The town's name has a certain elegance to it, almost reminiscent of a European setting. It's the birthplace of Cheryl Brennecke and her sister Jacques. Despite the typical bond between sisters, Cheryl had to grow up quickly. At just 16, she married Bob and soon became a mother, creating a divide between the siblings. However, a significant event would later bring them back together in their adult lives. Fast forward about two decades, Jack now in her 30s found love. His name was Clay Waller, a man with a speech impediment and an endearing awkwardness. Despite these quirks, Jacques cherished these traits as part of his charm. After marrying Clay, Jacques soon became pregnant, and once again, the two sisters found themselves sharing a common bond. The pregnancy brought them back together, and as Cheryl put it, they were practically stuck at the hip. However, her sister didn't quite warm up to her new brother-in-law, and neither did their parents. Despite that, Clay was the breadwinner working as a deputy for the Cape Girardeau County Sheriff's Office. Unfortunately, his tenure was short-lived as he was let go due to his untrustworthy demeanor and a sense of superiority. After being fired, he struggled to hold down a job, leaving the family's financial stability uncertain. Nevertheless, Jacques stepped up landing a managerial position at a major insurance firm and ensuring the family's needs were met. She proved to be the pillar of strength, especially when she found out she was expecting triplets. There are three more people to feed. She's lucky to have this wonderful work. Her sister claims that despite having a significant profession, she was still able to enjoy all the benefits of parenthood. She relished each and every second of it. However, there was one more infant to tend to Waller Clay. He wasn't the household helper. He took no action in addition to going to work. She was taking care of the children and the house. Following months or even years of this kind of behavior, Jacques began to distance herself from her spouse and spend more time with her sister's family. She wanted space, of course, and it wasn't only Clay's refusal to help. He had numerous affairs of which she was also aware. When she discovered further proof, she even questioned him about them. Naturally, though, he would always just deny it. Jacques desired a separation, however, she couldn't just suddenly surprise her husband with it. It wouldn't be safe, she realized. According to Jacques, in order to securely exit the marriage, she had to take things carefully. Jacques' final year on this planet would begin the day before her 39th birthday. Things started to get worse and worse during that year. Clay grew more erratic as Jacques grew increasingly determined to flee. Fearing for her life, Jacques Waller began recording all of Clay's threats against her and her triplets in a diary she kept on her work computer. The most unsettling of all occurred on March 23rd, a Wednesday. Clay told me that if he couldn't get me, he would kill our kids. He would take them for a weekend fishing trip, and then he would personally tell me they had drowned so he could see my face. Fearing for her life and the lives of her children, Jacques even admitted to her sister that she was afraid. However, Clay lost another job soon after which meant the two had to leave their home. He would remain at a friend's home while she would stay with her sister. She simply had the impression that everything was setting up for her split. When Clay moved to Jackson more than an hour away, she took the children who were then five years old and moved in with Cheryl and her husband Bob. Finally, Jack and Clay decided to meet in person to discuss the divorce proceedings on June 1st, right after Memorial Day that left only to complete the divorce. Maddox Jacques' son was spending the weekend with Clay, and the plan was for Jacques to pick up the kid after meeting her, soon to be ex-husband at her lawyer's office. Following the meeting, Jacques gave Cheryl a call and informed her that she would return home as soon as they were finished, and she had picked up her son. But that would be the final communication between the two sisters. After the phone call, three hours had gone by, and Jack Waller was still not home. 
When Cheryl realized she still hadn't returned home, she acknowledged feeling ill. She acknowledged feeling ill. She then detonated her sister's phone, leaving a ton of unanswered texts behind. She then attempted to contact the man Jacques had mentioned she would see. He answered, though not right away Cheryl had made a few attempts to call when he finally answered the phone. She threatened to call the police herself if she didn't talk to her sister in five minutes. After he inquired about the situation, she made a direct accusation against him claiming he had done something to his ex-wife. With us, news director of KZIM, KSIM, joining us, Fawn Riggin, what do you know? Nancy, I can tell you that everything we just heard was absolutely correct. She did go missing on June 1st, and the family has explained to us that she was estranged from her husband at the time, but in an interview granted on Tuesday with one of our sister newspapers, he said that they were not estranged and that they were not fighting and that she was just going to look into bankruptcy. The family denies that claim wholeheartedly and says they were definitely estranged. But right now, what we know is those three beautiful little kids don't know where their mommy is, nor does the family. So since June 1st, it's just, it's been chaos for the family and the community. With me right now, special guest, this is Jackie's sister, Cheryl Brennicky. Cheryl, thank you for being with us. Where are the triplets tonight? They're at home. They're at my house. That's their home. So they're with you. Why are they not with their father? Because he murdered their mother. He's threatened their lives. And um, does not he a safe want place them? for them to be. Does he want oh, them? Oh, he acts like he does. He really only wants one. The one he calls the boy. And um, he never has cared about the girls, and um, he'll t he'll take them if you know he needs them all three. But so uh, let me to ask you this: good. Let me ask you this, Cheryl. You're telling me that you've got custody. You you have them physically right now, and he's not trying to get all all three away. He doesn't want to take them home with him. Oh, he does. Yeah, yeah, he does. But he he really would he would really just like the boy, Maddox. That's the huh. one he, that's the, his pick of the litter. Cheryl, I'm gonna come right back to you, but joining me is Chief James Humphrey, Chief of Police, Jackson Police Department. Repeat, the husband, Clay Waller, is not a suspect right now, not a formal suspect. Chief, fill me in on the disappearance. What happened that day? Well, we're well into over 260 leads on this case, Nancy, at this time since June. June 1st, um, and through through Cheryl, our, her last known whereabouts on that day was she was going to pick up her son Maddox, uh, or her, she was under the impression she was going to pick up her son Maddox at Clay's house at approximately 4 o'clock that afternoon on the 1st, and uh, we have that from her own words on her cell phone that I am arriving here now, meaning I'm arriving here at Clay's, and that was the last words that uh, she spoke to, the, to her loved ones. And, and that's the last words we have from her with her loved ones. Clay refuted every claim Jacques left her other two triplets in the care of their parents in Ste. Genevieve, then got in her car and drove the hour or so to Jackson. She said that Clay Waller had slain her sister as she entered the Jackson Police Department. Police officers were still listening to her, even though she still had no proof. Actually, a sergeant from Jackson Police went to speak with Clay, he replied that he had seen her all day when someone asked him when he had last seen her. Clay reports to the police that, at some point after 11 a.m., he encountered Jack at a pharmacy. The two then went to lunch they parted ways after that and reconvened at the lawyer's office at 3 o'clock. Following that meeting, he claims Jack came over to talk about the divorce, rather than to pick up her son who Clay claims is actually staying with his girlfriend in Illinois. The narrative sounded shady.
Well, we've we've been able to clear, you know, well over the hundreds. I'm not, you know, we don't have everything in yet, but yesterday alone, I know um, we did close to 500, 600 acres. Um, we also were able to clear some water areas, um, and uh, and basically we're just continuing to work. There's there's multiple multiple areas that um, we have several teams going out to constantly, and then they come in, and of course the heat has been excruciating. Um, so we're making people come in in between assignments and rest and get you know hydrated again and take more water when they go back out and uh, so we've you know everybody's been pretty much following you know our protocol because we want to, our main priority is keeping everyone safe but you know there are some snakes and, and you know of course the ticks are bad this time of year but all in all I think it's it's even too hot for the snakes I think they're underground and and which is a good thing but um, I, I hear we got some possible rain coming and and that's actually going to um, help intensify the search for the dogs um, because a lot of our dogs have not been able to last more than you know 15 to 20 minutes in this heat just overwhelmed by the generosity of all these people coming out from all over the country I mean it's it's not just local people it's from South Carolina, Florida, all different parts of the country, and we are just overwhelmed that they would come out and search for our daughter, and they don't even know her. The group discovers one extremely important clue nearly right away. On this interstate, Shock's car was found abandoned. It looks like someone blew out one of the tires. Examining the flat tire, in greater detail, the detectives discovered the puncture was intentional. The whole thing looked arranged when the officers tried to speak with Clay. He told them he should call his attorney instead and refused to comment. Clay Waller had become a lawyer less than a day after Jacques vanished. Detectives thus moved swiftly to get warrants so they could investigate Clay's truck, Jacques' automobile, and the residence where he was sleeping. Something was seen in Agent Ritter's car's rear. It looked like a blood stain after that detectives looked over Clay's truck. The driver's side door had more blood spread on the interior. When the lab returned the results for both samples, it was shocking to learn that the material was fish blood. It had been Clay's deliberate choice to place it on his truck door. He claimed to have placed the fish blood there mostly as a test for law enforcement to see how observant they were, and he recorded himself doing so with his cell phone. Team members discovered, however, that the hallway carpet had vanished when they got back to Clay's residence. Even in the corridor they found what they thought to be blood on the walls. Even after examination revealed that the blood was truly Jacques, investigators were still unable to identify the source of the sample. They had a bad feeling afterward that the woman had passed away. There was still insufficient evidence, though in the absence of a body. Investigators recreated Jacques' final day of existence in an effort to uncover more information. It begins that day at around 11 o'clock at a drugstore where Jacques is seen approaching Clay. After almost two hours, Jacques was captured on camera at an ATM. The final footage of her alive was that one. They don't see Clay for the final time, though. A few hours later, he is seen in a toy store, dressed very differently. Clay's pickup was seen on another video. In addition to pulling a small boat, it featured a garbage can on the rear. Then Clay carefully cleaned it, being sure to remove any stains, possibly blood stains. The cops gave the public access to pictures of the boat. Two of the young people claimed to have seen that specific boat close to Devil's Island. Subsequently, they conducted several searches on that island without success. Agent Ritter persuaded him to come in for an official interview a few days after Jacques vanished. According to Clay, the accident in the kitchen, which wasn't a huge deal, was what caused the blood in the hallway. A small accident occurred. As a result, investigators closely watched Clay for the following few weeks. They had even placed a tracker on his vehicle, but he managed to locate it and would play with the cops leading them on irrational pursuits. Before long, Jacques' image was all over the place and with everyone in the town fixated on her disappearance. Clay Waller was getting desperate. He would humbly drive past her parents' home while claiming they were idiots and that they wouldn't find anything. Not only that, but he would insult the case's investigators. That optimism, though, was about to backfire. Clay threatened Cheryl, who was fully responsible for the triplets. For the cops to arrest him, that was sufficient. It was then that they realized he had broken the law. Investigators looked into Jack's disappearance before taking Clay away. 
In addition, he continues to insist that he is the true victim in this situation and denies any involvement at all. He even has hypotheses of his own blaming a former colleague named Gary for whatever happened to his wife. The police have already refuted that, which is the issue with it. Are you willing to, to say a few words today? Well, I'll say it after the thing. Okay. I'll say, it, I'll say it after the thing. Is there anything you'd like to say beforehand? Anything to the community or? I just, I just miss my wife and my kids and we're just, we're just, we're just we're trying to fight to see him. Do you think he'll get that? Um, well, I hope so. I mean, it's, it's been a hard time for us all. So we're just gonna just, just um, you know, keep hoping for the best. The best. Well, I just can't. I can't change how people feel. Um, I mean, it, there's a lot of emotions that are, are running high right now. Um, we just. I just don't know what to say yet. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I'm just, we're all just sad. It's just sad on, on both sides of the um, fence here. And still want to let people know that you didn't have anything to do with what's going on here and you want what everyone else wants. You want to find your wife? For sure, yeah, that's, we want her to come home alive, and we just, I still. Okay. In the end, he enters a guilty plea to the federal charge of endangering Jacques' sister and receives a five-year prison sentence. Prosecutors made efforts to guarantee that he would also face justice for Jacques at the same time. It took the prosecution over two years to turn over every stone before they felt confident enough to present their case. Clay faced charges of first-degree murder and tampering with tangible evidence. And no matter how hard the lawyer worked, a conviction was not given in the absence of a body. Furthermore, Jacques' family desired to see their daughter even more badly than they wanted Clay to receive the harshest penalty possible the parties concerned came to an agreement. The arrangement called for Clay Waller to confess to second-degree murder and take a 20-year prison sentence in exchange for disclosing what he had done to Jack. At last, when the time came, Clay would take the detectives directly back to the area they had previously examined. They were on Devil's Island. Just there, he truly did pick a suitable location for the deeds. I'm just saying Clay said that she must have been somewhere near here when the squad arrived but he was unable to determine the precise position. Investigators, however, located the body without delay. They recalled that he had spread fertilizer on the body, and they combined it all knowing that too much of it would rot tree roots. The following day, her parents dug her up and took her home. Her sister and dad worked at another challenging job. They needed to tell the triplets about the accident. All of Jack's friends and relatives attended her burial when the horrifying news was finally revealed. Her parents' 50th anniversary fell on the same day as the funeral. Good evening. After two long, painful years, today, family and friends laid Jackie Sue Waller to rest. At a packed church in Park Hills, they said goodbye to the mother of three who was murdered by her estranged husband on June 1st of 2011. Crystal Britt takes us to the service that was all about Jackie, her life, and her legacy. It's a day to celebrate the life of Jackie Sue Rawson. A crowded sanctuary filled with family and friends who've grieved the loss of Jackie for two years. On this day, closure for loved ones who endured such heartache and the unknown. I just want to say to the Rawson family, on behalf of everybody that's here, you have our respect and um, you all have handled this whole thing with great dignity and class. On this day, instead of celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary, Stan and Ruby Rawson say their final farewells to their daughter. For two years, thousands of us have witnessed the strength of their wedding vows. While there were plenty of tears, there was also joy and laughter as everyone here focused on memories of Jackie. Jackie was beautiful. It was because her inner beauty shines so bright. Remembered as a hard worker, a loyal friend, but most of all, a mother. 
Jackie carried this brag book over the course of time of the triplets growing and started off yay big and then it kept getting bigger and bigger. Friend Bly Gailmore talked about Jackie's quick wit and her practical jokes. Jackie embraced life and loved every minute. The life of the party, even at work. She would wear her boa. As you look around the crowd, several wore feather boas to honor Jackie's character. Yes, Jackie was fun, playful, kind-hearted. She was loving and she was lovable. Be still, be still, I know. Even through the smiles, you could sense the heartache in this room, the senselessness of her death. A lot of dark days and storms, a lot of questions that still yet may even want to be answered. The focus on faith and prayer. God did hear, God did answer. You know, one of the greatest ways that we can support this family is not only be here today, but to pray for them every day from here on out. Jackie, you are one of a kind. A tearful goodbye, yet tears of joy as they treasure every moment shared. Jackie Waller was then laid to rest here at Woodlawn Cemetery in Lettington, a family cemetery just right across the street from the Rossens Family Church. I leave you now for a little while for a home that awaits us all. We will be together once more when we hear the master's call. However, Clay's plea deal still had one more condition to meet. Clay would have to confess on television to every graphic detail of his wife's murder in order to receive a sentence of only 20 years. According to Clay, the conversation regarding a breakup started the year before Jack's death. Put differently, Clay states she was warned. He said that he dug the hole the day before when asked. Naturally, Clay provides an additional explanation for her desire to meet. Before the divorce became official, he claimed she asked to have one last sexual experience with him. Interrogators weren't buying it, even though it was an astounding allegation. They didn't buy what Clay said after that, either. He admitted that it all began accidentally in the kitchen after they returned to his apartment for sex. Jacques was allegedly taking something from the refrigerator and he was following suit. He once lifted his head and unintentionally struck her nose, causing it to bleed. Clay claims that Jacques started provoking him in the corridor where the investigators discovered all that blood, perhaps because she was upset over the incident. It was the point of no return, he remarked. She told him he would never see these children because of the kitchen mishap and Jacques' threats. This could be considered a crime of passion, saying he had no intention of killing his wife. What's wrong with that statement? Clay's own words from a few moments ago. Why had he said the day before that he had dug a hole? And it didn't stop there. There were other things as well. When asked if he had punched her, he admitted that he had given her a face slap and had put his forearm around her neck until she remained motionless. Jacques' autopsy, however, revealed many fractures to her face and skull consistent with blunt force trauma, which painted a different picture of the death. The fact that he was lying, it was obvious. The detectives do, however, accept Clay's account. That following Jacques' death, he placed her body in a garbage can, loaded it into the back of his vehicle, and then went to the toy store to meet with his girlfriend and five-year-old kid. According to Clay, he uttered a few last words to Jacques on Devil's Island after he had taken her over the river and disposed of her in the pre-dug grave. His family was the only thing he claimed to desire. In the end, many people found it difficult to accept Clay's confession. Clay will only get a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison for lying throughout a confession and even blaming the victim as part of his plea agreement. It turns out, though, that the prosecution had one more ruse up its sleeves. Although Clay Waller has acknowledged killing the mother of his three children, detectives aren't sure they've heard the whole story, and they haven't heard much remorse either. If there was any doubt about it, a phone conversation between him and a relative that was taped in the jailhouse shows the man had no regrets. In response to the request for an apology, Clay declared he would go to court and tell everyone to screw themselves. If they don't care about him, then why would he? He was obviously still thinking of himself as a victim. 
His final statement was that he was sorry not for what he had done, but rather because he was going to jail. Clay went on to add that he was satisfied with his 20-year sentence, believing that it was the maximum punishment they could inflict. However, it appears that he had high expectations. In his confession, Clay disclosed that the night before the murder, he had excavated his wife's tomb in Illinois and returned to Missouri to murder her. By chance, that turned out to be a breach of an infrequently utilized Interstate Domestic Violence Act. The federal accusation stemmed from Clay's intention to cross state borders and commit domestic abuse. He received a far heavier sentence of 35 years in prison for the offense. And he won't even start serving the whole 20 years for murder until that sentence even starts. Before being sent to serve his sentence, Clay was made to appear in court and hear victim impact statements from Jacques' family members. His own son's testimony was the most striking. unaffected by his own child's remarks. Investigators found that he was completely unaffected by his son's statements, but the story is far from ending. This insane story has one last chapter, which Clay wrote himself. Police discovered that the murderer had penned a diary in which he described his subsequent acts and the assassination of his wife. If you take my kids, I'll kill you, is the title of his book. It's succinct and direct, but we don't think it would be a bestseller. It was his final insult to the family he destroyed. It just goes to illustrate, in my opinion, how depraved Clay Waller is. Despite the fact that Clay's actions have left Jacques' family permanently shattered, they are far from broken. Their aunt and uncle have adopted the children. The nicest compliment, according to Cheryl, is that you can't even know what hardships they have had. They are excellent kids during their interview a few years later. Maddox stated that he wished to change the situation by providing his victim impact statement. Even though the triplets grieve their mother and are upset with their father, they are now living in a loving home. Cheryl Jacques' sister preserved their mother's memory. She was the one who initiated the investigation into her passing 